All right. So, hi, everyone. Um, today, uh, in this GSC meeting, uh, the thought was to kind of open, uh, open it for discussion um, around the tools uh, that could help uh, make it easier to deploy on those clusters instead of containers. So presently, what's happening is a um, number of our partners, as part of their field trial, field trials and proof of concept work, are doing this um, sort of individually and separately. Um, and uh, I thought it might be good to to do this work in a little more concerted fashion um, to make it easier for people who want to do this sort of stuff. Um, and this means both tools as well as documentation. And um, clearly, there is going to be some um, some concerns uh, that we have to consider during both packaging, so that the OMOS cluster can start up correctly um, when when running in a container, plus also to set up the environment for persistence, so that when you shut down uh, the cluster. Um, the ephemeral containers don't lose data um, and potentially provide some uh, recipes like for Ansible or other type of uh, orchestration tools. So, so just general that sort of discussion, um, what is it that's required to make this uh, easier to set up, deploy, and manage? And I know that uh, David, uh, CNI has done this, uh, this work um, yeah, we, we, we've done some of it. Some of it was around uh, scripting around the startup configs so that things like users, when they're added to Onos and keys are persisted between Onos restarts because that's managed in the file system right now. So some some basic volume mounts information. Um, we've done a little bit with a container the e pluris unum container which is a uh, service of metadata information for clusters when you things start in um an orchestration environment such as swarm or kubernetes and there's work around there trying to understand um when all the instances of a of onus expected instances of onus are started and then form the cluster there's some issues we run into when we get into dynamic cluster sizing as we scale around that type of thing. Um, the other issues we've run into is configuration push, as well as um, you know net config push, making sure the instance is up because you're not necessarily going just to have a a mount you know like the the where it's looking for a specific location within a container. So a container that sits there essentially um monitors if you will when the onos instances are up and when they're accepting rest requests and can push a config and we've done very variations on this where it's a one-time push versus it's more of a synchronization which says you know here are the aspects of the net config that i are that are important and static if you will make sure that these bits and pieces are up um, other parts of it may vary but uh, make sure these are there. So we've done it kind of as a one push, one time push as well as kind of a synchronization step. Um, there is the, how do you persist? You know, when you get in, even in a cluster environment, the data that goes back to some volume and persistence information you've set up before. Um, those are kind of the issues we've run into. Uh, as of 1109, the initial initial cluster information or initial cluster will come up with the metadata server, which is nice. Uh, thanks to Jordan for some of those changes there. Um, but again, some of the dynamic, if I want to, if I'm at a three node cluster and I want to scale to a five node cluster, uh, we've seen issues. Or if we are a five node cluster and want to scale to a three node cluster, or if we're at a three node cluster and one of the nodes fails and starts up with a different IP address. There's some of the uh, issues we've seen with that. Um, I know like Jordan. Partitioning, basically, right? Yeah, that's that's the kind of information. That's the kind of thing that, that we we've seen problems with. So if a, if a node dies and comes back with a different IP, um, is that basically the same as removing a node and adding a new node to the cluster? 
I, I think that is, and I think we've also run into some issues where, by default, the metadata stuff gets generated with IDs that are based on IP addresses. And I've talked to Jordan about this, and if you look at the default generator, that's how it works, and so that's where some of this came from. But he mentioned that you know if you could use consistent IDs and different IP addresses, that might alleviate some of this. Yeah. Uh, we haven't made that change yet, but that's something we're looking at. Yeah. So, so there is definitely issues around both uh, some of the, the tools currently set up to the, the tools currently used to set up the, the initial um, cluster configuration. But there's also additional kind of limitations with respect to dynamic clustering. I mean, these were made, they, they were deliberate concessions to reduce complexity. And uh, this has to do with the core cluster, uh, which is the, the initial sort of the base three nodes have to be, uh, have to be kind of static, I guess, in terms of the, their identities and IPs, I think. Meaning that we cannot we cannot remove or change. The yes, process. and that becomes a problem in in environments where compute nodes may go away or things of that nature. Right, right. And so, uh, I mean, you know, fixing some of these things may be trivial, and other things may be much harder. So we'll have to. Trade off what, what can be done. Yeah, in general, it sounds like there's a lot of or um, also kind of extra help by containers, things like you know, things to monitor the monitor when I was up and push the configuration, the things to the metadata, all of this stuff that you know, if people are trying to solve these problems separately, they're going to build the same stuff uh, over and over again. So. It seems like it'd be good for us to kind of centralize this stuff um, and, and you know, allow other people to kind of use it and contribute to it. Agreed. The, the, you know, the Unum container, for instance, is part of the Volta package right now, or Volta project right now, so it's freely available. And, you know, heck, if it's, I'm not saying it's even close to perfect, so, you know, contributions appreciate it, right? But if, you know, something like, if, if, Owen Lab wants to, or I want to, what do you guys would go by now? ONF? <laughs> want to be called, you know, someone wants to create that as part of the ONOS distribution, that'd be fine too. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be a good idea. And even stuff like sample, so, so Kubernetes deployments or sample um, form compose, you know, yeah. whatever, um, or at least documentation on those kind of things would be also nice. Yep, agreed. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly this is more to how um, rather than what, but I'm thinking that that sort of, sort of stuff should be kept in a separate repo. But uh, but at least we should provide such repository and structure for hosting that work so that uh, it you know, can be done more coordinated. Well, you know, even even a sample. A Docker Swarm stack file, even if that's part of, of the ONOS deployment, mm -hmm. if all those containers that it leverages, assuming some, you know, uh, partner containers it leverages are up on Docker Hub, then as a user of ONOS, I can literally download this compose file and go, right? I don't have to worry about multiple Git repos. I, again, if I'm, most people, most people want to use ONOS, they don't want to develop ONOS, so, you know, they, they may not even pull down Git, right? They don't necessarily want to do a Git clone anything. They want to just grab this YAML file, which describes either a pod configuration for Kubernetes or a stack configuration for Swarm and just say go. Oh, okay, so you're suggesting to make those, make that part of the uh, almost distribution, the binary distribution? Well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying make that easy to get to <laughs> and not, you know, I, I don't want to go to multiple repos to get to the point where I want to start up ONOS in a clustered environment. No, 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 I understand, which is why I was suggesting to put it separately so that you can just point to those set of tools and then yeah, use the binaries or Docker images that are released without having to do git clone on a full ONOS state. Yeah, and there, there were some, um, there's like a Helm, I think it's part of Kubernetes, there's a, 
the Helm Package Manager under Kubernetes, which is kind of like the um, like a Docker Hub, but for pod configuration files. So you can quickly, you know, download a configuration. So even putting up some approved configurations up in, in kind of standard locations where people expect them, that that's useful as well. Is um how how much of this sort of stuff uh, that uh, the CNI has done? How much is it uh, part of the closed source, and how much of it could be open or or nothing? Nothing is closed source. Um, I think all of it is in the open source. I, there, there was, I, I was go, walking around some of the repositories and I thought I even saw the config push, at least I think it was a one-time config push in the uh, open source. I didn't know it was there, but I'm glad it's there, if that's it. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Um, uh, let me see. There's, it, yeah, this config push is like a really simple script. It basically retries curl until it succeeds and with a sleep delay. Right. It, it's that simple. I mean, and that's the one-time push. Right. It, once it once it gets pushed, it's done. That that's the simplest one. There's another one that that again could be open source, or I could find the source of it anymore which basically tries to do a little more intelligent, but even that was a hack shell script. If you wanted one that does kind of the synchronization, it should become open source and rewritten in, in a little better form. And where are these things right now? I mean, they're just Docker containers? Um, yeah, they're, they're up on Docker Hub, so I'm doing some experimentation on that one, but um, if you look in the Volta repository under Unum is the uh, metadata server. Uh, it, it works with Swarm right now, needs to be um, extended to work with Kubernetes. And the config push script, the Docker file is well, the Docker file for both of these are in the Volta uh, repository. And again, the config push is like five lines of script. Okay, maybe it's more than five. Like, um, if, if Seven. Someone, any time we have, there is actually quite a lot of uh, material to, to pull from, right? Um, you know, we have some of these containers. We have some of the configuration. It's kind of a matter of kind of centralizing them and documenting a little bit. About yeah. How to install it. Yeah, this the one that we're, you're showing right now. It basically works on based on labels, so you can label um, networks that you want to use. You, you know, because containers can be with multiple networks in Swarm. You can label instances that you want to include as part of the cluster, and it basically searches for that information. And when everything's up and running, it'll. Uh... <laughs> Thanks, Bob. I'll try to be a little quieter. Um... <laughs> and, and form the cluster. Your mic is just really loud and done a small one. Isn't it? Not quite sure how to change that, to be honest. It's a Bluetooth headset. Okay. I mean, any suggestions to what would be kind of the best way to get this going? Um, well, so it seems like the information is many places, as John has alluded. I have an anti-suggestion. <laughs> yeah, what, Bob? Uh, my suggestion is don't do this. It's it's the wrong approach. Like, <laughs> you know, 
it's like such a horrible idea in so many dimensions like this you know just like deploying you know applications and containers is just an astonishingly terrible idea and the root is that um you know operating systems have poor isolation and uh people aren't good at configuring things or managing applications and operating systems but it, this is just an astonishingly terrible and stupid way of doing things it'll just waste an astonishing amount of your time and make a system that is brittle and just general shit. So <clears throat> my suggestion is, you know, yeah, you can do this and it'll it'll be okay, but in the long run it's it's the opposite of what you want to do. And you got to realize that you've gotten in bed with Java, but Java has some nice properties, not the least of which is that you can make, you know, downloadable single click archives that just start up and run with the local file system and you know, gosh, doesn't that sound like a container? Yeah, it does, because it is. Um, so, you know, you don't need to mess with Docker or Kubernetes or all this other crap. Just fix Onos so that it actually works. Make it so that instances don't depend on having different IP addresses. Make it so they can easily find each other or you can easily configure them, you know, to say, okay, find each other on this network, whatever, and they can find each other on a subnet. You can just, you know, put in, you know, some minimal amount of configuration information where they can just find each other and then just load your config into one Onus instance and you should be done. So, you know, this whole thing of, oh, we need Kubernetes or Docker or OpenStack to manage our like, you know, infrastructure to run Onus on. This is just idiotic and stupid. Like it's the opposite of what you want. And it's this product of this really wrong headed thinking, which has overtaken the industry, you know, thinking that, oh yeah, these quote unquote microservices, which are really heavyweight macro services where every single application has to have its own version of the operating system. It's, just evil madness and needs to die. <laughs> well, uh, some of that I agree with, actually. Um, I, I, and the smarter you are, the more you'll agree with it. So, and the more experience <laughs> you have. I, think. <laughs> I, I actually do think it it would be regardless of containers, right? Completely orthogonal this issue. Having known as, uh, as an easier startup, having it be able to essentially discover its peers and form clusters. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's that's the root problem of this whole thing. The reason why people are going down this this road to evil madness is that we really haven't thought out. You know, we haven't really come up with a good user facing service surface of Onos in so many dimensions. But in tip in particular, in installation, uh, startup, and operation is really super painful. But it, it should be super easy, right? You should just like, you know, if I like you know, just start it up on two nodes that are on the same LAN, like, you know, it should be like, is it okay for this guy to join the cluster? You know, I mean, I don't know, or not, you know, there, there should be some easy way you can have maybe secure, maybe, you know, secure default or something, you know, but basically start it up, you know, do some minimal amount of approval and security, and then you should really be good to go. I, I don't know, just sort of think about that and think of, you know, in the best of all possible worlds, how would you make it as easy as possible? And you know, frankly, on Ubuntu, it should be as easy as you know, point it to a PPA, uh, apt install Onos and run it, and that's all you. Or you know, maybe not even install it. Maybe just curl Onos, Java Onos, and you're done, right? You know, you know, on Windows, just download it, right? You know, download it from the distribution wiki and just double click it, and it just runs. You know, or or drag and drop it into Windows services and it just runs it, you know, something like that. Just just make it as easy as possible. Like all this, you know, dependencies on like, oh, we have 10 different container infrastructures or virtual machine infrastructures that we might want to support. That's that's just, you know, evil madness. And it's 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 really wrong, I think, to do what we've done, which is to, you know, add in all these kind of Linux and Ubuntu dependencies into Onos. It's it's really the opposite direction of how we want to go in the long run. The, the one thing people, well, there's lots of reasons people like, I think, container orchestration environments. And one of that is the the ability to Stupidity. say, look, madness. No, even beyond that, it, it, it is the, I want to start up three instances, right? I want to, I want to scale to five instances. They give you primitives to help do this. They no, also no, they, do. No, they don't. <laughs> yes, they, <laughs> they, do. really, they really don't. They give you the opposite of what you want. Like, like, you know, why do you care? Like, you know, yeah, okay, I can get, a, I mean, why is it better to have three Onuses running in different containers versus three Onus running, Onuses running in different processes? And, you know, answer, it, it really isn't. It gives you slightly more 
isolate. Yeah, it it isn't, isn't, but again, when I'm running in Docker Swarm or Kubernetes or Mesos or any of these, I'm also making sure that you can do this based on policy and files that they're running on different hosts in, in kind of this. Uh, like I'm sort of, I'm sort of okay with this. I, I just sort of think that, you know, that the amount of like Docker or Kubernetes should be like, you know, a kilobyte or something. Right. I, I mean, it, it could be a tiny amount of data. Right. And all the heavy lifting should be done by Onos proper. Right. And so, you know, oh, I, I agree with that. To, David, to be honest. So David, so David, so David I, I'm not necessarily saying, Oh, we should forbid Onus for from running on Docker, or we should forbid it for running on Kubernetes, or you know, because you have whatever crappy infrastructure you have. It's like, oh, we're stuck with you know OpenStack. So that's all we have. So we want it to be easily runnable on OpenStack. But I guess my point is that you know, create is it Docker? Is it Onus itself should do all the heavy lifting, and everything else should basically be a no-brainer and should be like you know, ten lines of config or something. I, I would love that. You know, this whole Unum, the e pluris Unum container, that could go away. I would love for it to go away. I would love for the, you know, be able to put a bunch of Onus instances out there and, and they kind of naturally form a cluster. That would be wonderful. But it doesn't yeah. do that today. So that's why I have this this Unum container. So um, yeah, I think I think you basically nailed it, right? So that's the whole purpose of this effort, right? We, I mean, if you squint and forget that we're talking about maybe uh, using specific frameworks, the whole idea is to be able to run um, around on us easier using different orchestration frameworks, regardless of whether it's process isolation, VM, dot containers, whatever. Basically, be able to run them as these sort of nuggets out there. Um, you still need to and still need to provide tools to be able to do this information, to be able to know, to know how to do this, what are the best practices. And clearly, we do not want to make Onos dependent on it, right? The Onos at its core should remain as, as simple as, as it is in terms of sort of the neutrality of its distribution. So the idea is not to change the kind of the canonical distribution will remain to be just a tar GB. Yeah, yeah. So I... else. But we want to come up with a set of declarations to make it easier for people to run it in, in kind of different environments. And to be able to manage to, to install, deploy, and and manage the cluster um, as easily as possible. So that's what we're talking about. Coming up with a platform for people to collaborate on doing this without reinventing the wheel every single time. Yeah, yeah. I, I might suggest, Thomas, that you know uh, you want to focus on you know treating the the cause rather than the symptoms and so i think we see a lot of symptoms here but there's high leverage if you just make onos really easy to run <laughs> to begin with like a lot of these other problems will drastically simplify themselves and so uh, you know i see you know you're treating the symptoms rather than the cause of the disease and no, I, I, don't, I don't think so i mean i can argue that it makes it really easy to to to, to set up onos i mean there's screencasts with within a few minutes, I can form a cluster and get it going. There's it's really, it's not that difficult. I think some of the complexities uh, um, come from some of the operational requirements, right? Be able to provision the machines themselves. And and I, I don't necessarily want to solve well, like, or, or change the industry mindset on which which containers or which, which orchestration platform they use to manage their infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I guess my suggestion was that if you make on a simple, you know, easy brain dead simple to, to run in general, and you remove, you know, dependencies, for example, on things like IP addresses, and you make it so that they can automatically discover and sort of have a self healing on us cluster, um, you, you know, that will basically drastic, potentially drastically simplify running it on any infrastructure. And that's your sort of point of highest leverage that I think it would be really wise to think about. Sure. I mean, there are certain things that we can do within the product itself, like some of removing some of the limitations of the dynamic clustering, right? Fine. But 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 there are special considerations when it comes to using in kind of ephemeral environments where where the container itself doesn't really have any state and we can can vaporize, right? And then new ones can be added. So we. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's good. But I I would suggest that that's. Uh independent of the infrastructure, right? Like, you, you know, you don't care about whether it's EC2 ephemeral containers or whether it's some Docker ephemeral or Kubernetes, right? I mean, the, the root issue is that is that you just want uh, 
ephemeral instances to work with some shared state. And my suggestion is that that shared state should be, you know, shared persistent state should be handled by uh, by Java in some platform in a way. Yeah, but I think in this specific case, we run a file of of, of the Citrix deployment message, right? I mean, uh, I don't know. Maybe right I just can't. Assume, right now, we assume that the controller uh, has its own file system where it can store state, and whether that file system is uh, as local or whether it's somewhere on a shared storage, we really don't care. We're just using the. Yeah, file that's not bad. But the problem is in the case of the the, the, uh, the Docker containers. Uh, when you ignite them, uh, when you scrap them, um, the, it's gone. Unless you make some provisions for making sure that those containers are there, those those parts of the file systems are mounted on some shared storage so that uh, the, we, we properly capture the state. Yeah, that sounds like a Docker problem and maybe not an Amazon oh, no, problem. I understand. So it's a it's a it's a it's a specific it's a it's a problem that we need to solve in the context of a specific deployment scheme, and that's what we're talking about here, coming up with a set of tools. So I'm really not right now. I don't think it's. I would like to leave the discussion whether this is wise or not uh, aside, because it, this is what the industry is doing, and it's kind of our, what our customers are asking us to do. And yeah, everyone else is doing it. That must be right. No, no, I'm not. Yeah, again, I, I, I'm not. I, to me, that's a separate discussion, right? I, I'm not oh. necessarily disagreeing with you here, but but it's really irrelevant whether I agree with you or not. There's a number of customers are wanting to do this, and um, there is some strong motivations for wanting to do it. There are some downsides for for um, for doing it, but I take it as a given that this is what's required, and. Uh, my goal here is to come up with more of a coordinated effort to try to accomplish this so that we don't sort of waste the, co the, the community doesn't waste its time repeatedly trying to reinvent the wheel because we didn't provide a sort of a home for uh, this coordination. That's simply the, what I'm trying to accomplish here. Yeah, that seems like kind of a fundamental mistake to me, but good luck with that. Yeah. So the idea is to but if you could think of trying to make stuff as like orthogonal and generic as possible and also think about how you can improve the platform itself to to uh, sort of facilitate this and you know minimize the amount of config for docker or kubernetes like i said it should be a tiny tiny amount like 20 lines or something for sure i mean and that's the whole uh, some of it may be exactly that and uh, right so clearly there's elements of uh, of this that will involve Removing some limitations in the uh, in the platform itself and to simplify the platform further. Great. That will apply in the generic context, uh, or basically across the board. And it would be good to know what those things are. And then, but there is also some uh, collateral that's specific to each of the platforms, and yeah, some of it may be just a few lines of recipes or or documentation. And so that's really all we're talking about. But but why recreate it over and over again? when some of those best practices could be, be documented and, uh, and potentially even codified and, and programmatic uh, artifacts. So, um, the, do you... <coughs> David, um, what about, um, do you think the setting up like at least initially a wiki page or a repo where some of this stuff could be organized or should we just- uh, I think initially, if anything, it's gonna be documentation. You know, we document what we do now and what's available and then we can figure out once to go. I mean, I, I completely agree it, um, that, you know, being able to have, for instance, the bottom line there, one of those instances, auto discovery each other would be a, a far superior solution to what we're doing now. We're, what we're doing now is because what we have, right? With the situation we're in. Um, so I think documenting where we are, and then it becomes a planning issue in terms of understanding what changes we're gonna make to the core platform and what changes need to be made in kind of these buddy buddy applications, if you will. Yeah, 
would you prefer <clears throat> we could either set up a page on a wiki uh, or would you prefer if you just started like a shared Google Doc and uh, which might be easier to collaborate on and comment on? Yeah, that's that's always a question, right? The wikis are easier to find. It's a little harder to cooperate, cooperate, uh, edit in a community. Um, Maybe you can set up kind of like a, just a um, portal for on a wiki. For this let, let, yeah, let me start with the wiki and I'll document some of it um, and we can go from there. Okay, that'd be great. If you wouldn't mind helping him, then that'd be, be awesome. Not at all. And we can uh, then ask some of our partners who are uh, tackling similar problems to see if they could uh, uh, contribute to this, both in terms okay. of what it is that they're looking to get out of this and, uh, and potentially what they could contribute to it in terms of uh, the work that they've already done. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you then uh, set this up and let the TST know when that page is set up. And yep. I'll, when, I, when it gets done, I'll send you the link. And then we can maybe consider some of this work uh, to come to open it up for the community as part of the uh, end, end release planning. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Anybody has anything else, or then I'll um, I'll think sort of specifically too because he, might, he mentioned some of these things before. Unfortunately, couldn't make it. Okay. <coughs> All right. Unless people have anything else to to add, suggest, and probably call it today. Yeah, thanks for listening a bit. I, I added a couple things to the to the Google Doc, I, and uh, I think there, are, it's worth everyone thinking about ways to you know make easy, make Onos easier to install and deploy, and sort of I, I like this idea of a self healing, self configuring Onos cluster that you know just does the right thing automatically out of the box. I think that would you know really help both uh, in enabling deployment and also reducing the support burden that you guys are facing. Yeah, no, I could com complete agreement, right? And then, um, and and you know, there's some of the limitations that are there today, like for example, this reliance on the sort of the bare cluster um, um, was simply based on an assumptions at one point in time, which we thought were reasonable, and uh, and that eliminated a whole bunch of complexity. But in an environment like these, which are highly dynamic, and we don't sort of have a fixed point in space and time, it, it clearly those limitations proved to be an obstacle, and actually. You know, introduce complex. Basically, effectively, they eliminated complexity from one place, but pushed it to another. And so, you know, it's maybe time to revisit those things and see if you can uh, subsume the complexity back into the container and uh, make it make it easy. I mean, into the into the Onos uh, code itself, and then make it easier to be used in this environment. Yeah, definitely. And I, I also want to say that dynamic environments will also uh, facilitate cluster development. Uh, so that's another nice, that will be another potential nice uh, bonus if, if uh, there's better sort of dynamics support for dynamic things clusters. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Bob. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll probably not see you next week, I think, because it's close to holidays. Yep. Uh, but two weeks from now, we'll have a meeting. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.